So thank you very much for inviting me and being part of this uh, very interesting conference. Uh, before I start, I want to say that I really welcome the, initia the, vis uh, the Visit IMSS uh, initiative that was started by the IMSS leading team, uh, Tito, Pietro, and Massimo, and others. And I think this has a huge potential uh, by uh, giving access uh, to data to uh, researchers uh, and improve in particular the communication between policymakers uh, and academics. Of course, for us uh, academic researchers, uh, it's very uh, interesting and important to get access to interesting data and to understand why uh, policies are implemented to the, and just, yes. so that uh, we better understand uh, the environment uh, under which this policy have been, uh, have been started. But I have been uh, working with Austrian social security data and uh, Swiss social security data since uh, now, by now 20 years. And over time, I actually have, uh, I have uh, experienced that uh, policymakers are increasingly, increasingly willing to listen and also increasingly willing to ask for our expertise. So I think this is something that is really very uh, welcome and I also want to re-emphasize what Camille has said before, that it, I find it very, very important to give young researchers access uh, to the data. They bring in the skills, the, the, they bring in the energy, and they bring in the ideas. So it's, this is uh, something that is uh, very appreciated, very much appreciated. So I, I have to discuss uh, three papers. These are very interesting projects. They are highly policy relevant. And they, they are examples uh, that show that uh, administrative data, or so security data, can bring insights into these questions. So the first paper uh, by Enrica was uh, about family policies and labor supply of mothers. And of course, the, the important issue here is how can we better understand the increasing, uh, the, the, the persistent uh, gender gap on labor markets and of course, in doing so, we need to uh, look at what happens around the birth of a child. Now, the second issue is about uh, immigration. Immigration is a topic uh, uh, in, uh, in all over the world, in Europe in particular, if we, if we look at recent uh, elections. I'm Austrian and we had uh, a, a particular uh, tough uh, uh, campaign that was very strongly uh, related to immigration issues. And uh, regularizing uh, issues on, uh, related to undocumented in uh, immigrants is uh, an important uh, uh, aspect in this, uh, in this uh, issue. Now, the final paper is about the urban wage premium and the role of collective bargaining. The urban wage premium is a longstanding debate uh, in, uh, in labor economics and better understanding uh, this uh, premium is, of course, very important uh, also in relation to uh, labor market institutions. So this brings me to the, to the first paper uh, by Enrica, and she addresses two important uh, research questions. The first is how large are the uh, earnings penalties for, mother af for mothers after the birth of a child? And uh, as we have seen, these penalties are uh, very large, uh, in Italy, but this is not only the case in Italy, even in the Scandinavian countries, you have large er earnings penalties. And in other countries, like in Austria, you have even uh, much larger earnings pen penalties that you see uh, in Italy. Okay. And of course, the important question is what we ca can we do about it? And are there family policies uh, that uh, affect return to work and employment and uh, that uh, help to decrease earnings penalties and help to catch up on the labor market after the baby break. Okay. Now these are the, uh, here I just uh, repeat the, uh, the, the, the rules in Italy. So Italian rules are, say, uh, some, uh, substantially more general than, uh, generous than in, in the US or also in Switzerland, where you, in Switzerland we have uh, 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 maternity leave, where we have uh, income replacement, but beyond that there's nothing. Okay. And uh, it's in, uh, uh, in Italy, you have parental leave. You get uh, a, a, a transfer equal to 30% of the previous wage. And uh, uh, introduced in uh, 
September 2012, there's the bonus infancia that uh, subsidizes mothers uh, for going back to work. Okay? So here, Italy has gone a little uh, different route than other countries like Austria, where we have changed, we, have, we had also changes in uh, family policies that made parental leaves shorter, but paid a higher transfer, and uh, mothers have the choice uh, to, uh, to take alternative uh, parental leave durations and, uh, and associated with, the, with it, alternative sizes of the parental leave transfer. Okay. Uh, here, of course, IMS data are extremely helpful. We can uh, look at uh, labor market outcomes and matches to data on claims, and we have the pre precise the timing of, of the claims, so we can really look very, very carefully at the dynamics of return to work behavior after the birth of a child. And what Enrica does here is she looks at uh, an earnings penalty sample where she studies mothers who, who uh, deliver the child up to the year 2012, which allows her uh, to uh, see what happens up until uh, the age three of the, of, of, uh, the child. And uh, the bonus infancia sample, which is kind of the new policy that uh, she can evaluate with the IMS data, here she, ca she can only look at the very short run effect because simply the data are only available until uh, 2015 and the relevant policy change took place in the year 2015. So really we can look at, uh, only look at a very short run effect. Now this is the main graph concerning the earnings penalty and uh, this uh, uh, tells us that the earnings penalty is very large and it is persistently large. So if you look at, say, uh, paper, uh, uh, Camille has a paper on, on, on Denmark uh, drawing a graph uh, similar to that, you would see a much lower earnings penalty. Okay. We looked at uh, similar data from Austria, and we, we see a much, much higher earnings penalty. And this, co this corresponds very strongly to the family policies we have. In Denmark, you have uh, a supply of childcare, in Austria, you don't have supply of childcare, but you have much longer parental leaves that are uh, subsidized by, uh, by uh, parental leave transfers. So uh, here, it Italy is somehow in the middle, and this corresponds also to, also to the policy. What you do see neither in Denmark nor in Austria is that the penalty starts to increase again. And I think this is really something that needs uh, to be explained carefully and better understood uh, how this comes about. And here it's also, of course, very important to have uh, a longer time series and to uh, really uh, see whether this uh, gap uh, starts or continues to increase uh, and, uh, and uh, try to understand this uh, issue better. Now the bonus infancia, this, this is the, uh, the subsidy, so to say, for going back to work earlier. Okay. This, uh, this is the main graph that, uh, uh, where we can see uh, the impact. So this is actually telling us that uh, during the six months where you can draw uh, uh, the, the bonus, those who take up the bonus actually have higher earnings. To some extent this is mechanical because uh, uh, you're actually you, you're taking up a program that allows you to go back to work and not so, there's no, it's not really a surprise that we don't uh, see uh, higher earnings for them. Interestingly, after the six months have gone by, the uh, earnings gap diminish, uh, is, is gone, but this essentially means that those who, uh, who did not take up the bonus okay, and uh, 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 who have run out of the parental leave transfer go back to work. So they catch up to those, uh, to, to the bonus, uh, to the bonus uh, 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 mothers. Now, of course, uh, what we see here is uh, are two groups that are endogenously or uh, th that are self-selected and better understanding uh, what would have been the case if uh, these, women, these uh, mothers would not have had the opportunity to take up the bonus is the real challenge. Okay? And uh, Enrique goes some steps towards this by looking at uh, regional variation in regional uh, public child care and uh, finds that uh, where uh, 
that take up is indeed higher where uh, where the childcare provisions are uh, more prevalent and which uh, gives us some idea that there may be a rationing in the provision of regional child care. Okay. Now, in total, it's, uh, it, uh, the, the, this is a very interesting uh, project, but in order to uh, really make progress, we need to uh, see longer, uh, the more, more the long time responses, and in a year or two from now, uh, the, the data will be, uh, will be there. So this brings me to the second uh, paper, regularizing uh, migrant workers. And the question here is uh, what happens if uh, you allow undocumented, uh, grant uh, undocumented in immigrants uh, uh, legal status? This is, of course, a very topical question. There are many, many undocumented immigrants in Europe, particularly uh, in, uh, since the, since the uh, refugee crisis from Syria we had in uh, 2015. But this is also uh, not only uh, an, an issue in Europe, but think about DACA and the Dreamers in the US, where this is also an important uh, topic. So what the authors can study here is uh, the regularization program that was implemented in Italy in the year 2002, and uh, which grant work and resident permit for a two-year period for uh, undocumented immigrants and employers actually have to apply for uh, this program and confirm that the worker has, has uh, had employment for at least three months in the firm and pay an amnesty fee uh, of uh, 700 euros. What I really found striking is how large this program was. Okay. So there were in total 700,000 uh, employers who filed an application. And if you look, I, I looked up the, the, uh, the immigration studies of legal immigrants, in Italy there were 1.3 million uh, immigrant residents. Only a part of them were employed, so the order of magnitude is really huge. Okay. Uh, for some reason, we don't see only uh, 200,000 in the IM state, and this has to do with the particular sectors uh, that, uh, where these undocumented uh, immigrants uh, go. And uh, uh, so um, one question that, uh, uh, that uh, struck me is how exactly can you uh, identify uh, the regularized immigrants uh, in the data? So there is no, uh, there is no application sample and uh, there may be measurement errors in the inferred uh, immigration, uh, uh, in, in the inferred amnesty status. Uh, concerning uh, identification, of course, uh, the choice of applying for amnesty for, uh, for, the, for the regularization amnesty is endogenous to the firm, and what the authors do is that they use regional var variation in auditing intensity. Okay. But I was wondering whether, since the program uh, is so huge, whether uh, not most of the firms were uh, applying anyway, so the, you have almost full compliance, and uh, so this was uh, something that uh, that I found uh, uh, relevant and interesting. So one uh, particularly striking graph that uh, the authors come up with is uh, uh, this. Uh, these are survivor graphs. This is on the vertical axis, you see the fraction uh, of the workers that uh, were regularized in the year 2002 that still remain in Italy. Okay. So this is, I found this striking because, uh, because typically you would see uh, a large uh, number of workers return migrating to their home country. Okay. And so for instance, uh, in Swiss state that we would have uh, uh, roughly 50% of the workers still remaining in the country after, after four to five years. Uh, and uh, this work, these undocumented immigrants, seem to, uh, seems to be a very specific group that has a very high labor for, for its attachment to the Italian labor market. And uh, at the same time, we see a very large uh, mobility, both across regions, across sectors, and also across firms. So only 20% uh, of those regularized in the year 2002 are still 
in the same firm in, by the year 2006. Okay. So the results are we don't see any long-lasting effect on employment and wages uh, in, uh, in these uh, firms that applied, filed an amnesty uh, application. We also do not see a much effect on native workers, okay, on those co-workers in these firms. They have somewhat higher uh, job separation rates, but uh, we do not see any significant impact on wages and employment. Okay? Uh, but I thought that what uh, I would urge the authors to do is to better understand mobility choices of these regularized workers. And here, of course, that the fact that we don't see any impact uh, on uh, native workers is kind of a reminiscent of the immigration literature, okay, where also we, it could be that uh, job mobility, uh, which, uh, uh, that job mobility kind of disguises uh, a potential uh, effect of this. Uh, of this intervention. Now the final paper is about uh, collective bargaining, uh, cost of living, and uh, the urban wage premium. The urban wage premium is a, is a stylized fact. You see it in uh, almost all data sets. Jobs in larger in cities pay higher nominal wages than jobs in rural areas. And uh, the project here contributes in two ways to the literature. First, uh, it uh, correct for differential prices between uh, urban and rural areas and looks at the real wage uh, premium, the, the urban real wage premium. And at the same time, it emphasizes uh, specific the, the collective bargaining institutions that prevail uh, in Italy. So we have very high coverage by collective bargaining. About 80% of the workers uh, are covered by such contracts and there's no change uh, in coverage over time. The, what, what the other authors do here is they uh, look at data from, uh, the, from real estate prices and uh, they observe transactions data at the municipality level. So they get a very fine original disaggregation of, uh, of uh, housing prices and they use this original municipality level housing prices to uh, to uh, construct a municipality level consu consumer price index. Of course, at the municipality level, we don't, have, we don't observe consumer prices. We only observe it at the province level. But using the, the uh, correlation at the province level between, the, co between uh, the consumer prices and the housing prices, and then can be used to impute uh, the uh, municipality consumer price level based on the observed housing, municipality housing price index. Okay. So this is uh, kind of uh, an uh, innovative uh, uh, aspect of, uh, of this paper. Then uh, the, the IMS data also report the contract on the collective bargaining so they can uh, control for uh, contract fixed effect and account for uh, uh, this, uh, the uh, potential impact of uh, bargaining institutions on the urban uh, wage premium. Okay. Now, if they do what the literature does and correlate the nominal, uh, nominal wages with, uh, with uh, population density, then they find a, a, a positive uh, elasticity as uh, found in many other studies, but this disappears when uh, they control for worker characteristics and, and uh, collective bargaining contracts. And if they do the same thing for the real wage, they find no correlation in the raw data and an even negative correlation uh, between uh, when they control for, for characteristics. One possible explanation here is, of course, that uh, workers are willing to accept lower real wages in cities because cities provide uh, better public goods and uh, and uh, so you are, you are willing to, uh, to move to the city and work in, and, and live in the city even though your real wage is uh, lower. Okay. Now here is something that the authors could do that, is, that I find important because the IMS data give you also the firm information and you can apply uh, techniques that allow you uh, to, uh, to decompose the observed wage in a worker and a firm component. 
and the worker component, if the, the urban wage premium is, to, is due to the worker component, the sorting uh, the mechanism would be relevant, meaning that the talented and uh, high wage workers would move to the cities. If uh, the firm component is relevant, then and uh, then and it is that the high wage firms cluster in the cities, then this uh, uh, mechanism of agglomeration and clustering of high productivity firms may be a driving force uh, behind the urban wage premium. Okay. So another issue that is I think is important is that we need to look more carefully at the dynamics of the of the urban wage premium, because it is very unlikely that nominal wages and housing prices are moving uh, pari passu all the time. Just think about uh, the, the, what happened during the Great Depression, uh, the, the Great Recession. We had a decrease in, in, in housing prices, and housing prices uh, pick up again. And so it may be that the uh, real wage premium varies uh, a, a lot across uh, periods. Okay. A final issue is that. Here we look at the average wage, but it may be very important to look at different points in the wage, in, in the wage distribution, and uh, various workers along the wage distribution may be affected uh, very differently, and I urge the authors uh, to uh, push their project uh, in this direction. <laughs>